Okay, so um, in the last chapters, we've talked about some of the most important ideas that we'll be seeing uh, over and over again throughout this course. We talked about forces, we've talked about accelerations, the relationship between forces and accelerations, both when an object is translating and when it's rotating or flipping through space. Um, and we also introduced the idea that in physics, there are these conserved quantities, things like energy, linear momentum, and angular momentum that have a constant amount in the whole universe. And so you cannot create or destroy any amount of these conserved quantities. Um, all you can do is kind of exchange them either between one object and another, or in the case of energy, convert it from one form of energy to another form of energy. Um, so we will, again, be seeing these concepts and applying them to everything in the rest of this class. Uh, and so in this chapter, uh, we're going to start exploring how lots of different things in the everyday world kind of uh, fit into that framework of thinking about energies, thinking about forces, and thinking about how um, uh, these kind of concepts help us understand what's going on in the world around us. Uh, so to start out, um, we're going to talk about springs and scales. So to begin our discussion of springs and scales, I want to talk about the idea of measuring, uh, measuring weights. You know, we've introduced mass as one of the fundamental units um, in describing a physical quantity, a physical object. It's kind of a way of saying how much stuff is in an object. Um, but it turns out, you know, measuring the mass of an object is actually really quite tricky uh, in some ways, at least measuring it directly. Um, you know, if you want to know the mass of some collection of atoms or molecules, uh, to do that precisely, you actually have to know, you're trying to measure how many atoms there are. And atoms are small, and so it's hard to count them. So much easier than measuring the mass of an object is measuring the weight of an object. Of an object. Measuring weight. Uh, measuring weight. Um, because remember, weight is a measure of the force uh, due to gravity acting on an object. Uh, and when, a, when an object is, say, sitting flat on the ground, it's also the force with which that object is pushing down against the ground. So how could we go about measuring weight? Um, well, let me give you two kind of uh, potential answers to this. So two kind of easy uh, ways to measure weight. To measure weight. You know, one, one, uh, one version makes use of what we learned in the last chapter when we were talking about rotational motion, torques, seesaws, and this kind of thing. And that's uh, the so-called balance scales. So, you know, balance scale, uh, I've got a picture in the lecture notes if you like. Maybe you associate them with, like, measuring things in a pharmacy or something. It's basically, uh, it's basically a lever. You have two baskets hanging at equal distances from, uh, from say, two sides of uh, this, like, balance beam-like object. And the idea is that... Um, you have a collection of objects that are carefully calibrated. So you've bought a set of you know little different weights you can put in that someone else has told you help define your system of units, right? And really, that's all units are, as we talked about in the first chapter. Some basically arbitrary um, metric according to which we measure some particular dimensional quantity. So the idea is that you have some unknown object. Maybe it's like a little uh, red apple. And, you know, if you just put the apple in this basket over here, well, that apple is uh, experiencing uh, its weight. It's got a force due to gravity. And that means it's pulling down on this basket with force equal to that. And that basket is connected by, say, chains or something to the end of this balance beam. So if you only have something on this side, you have a force acting at some distance from a pivot point. That means you're exerting a torque. So the object... Uh, exerts a torque, exerts a torque, um, and if there's a net torque on this this beam, this bar, um, so the beam will start to rotate. So the beam will have an angular acceleration. Angular acceleration. Remember, just like uh, just like forces. Uh, Having a net force gives you a translational acceleration. Um, the torque on an object, the torque, oops, the torque on an object, um, 
there we go, that's the way you draw a tau, um, is given by this like moment of inertia object times the angular acceleration. Right? So uh, what do you do then uh, to stop this beam from starting to rotate? You start putting you know, your carefully calibrated masses over on this side of the scales, and you keep adding them until, uh, until the beam does not accelerate at all. Right? And once you've done that, you know that the collection of masses, which again are pulling down, have a, have a weight associated with them, so they have a force due to gravity of these weights, whereas this is the force due to gravity of, say, this apple. And then, you know, this apple is exerting uh, a torque that would want to make the beam rotate this way. These weights would want to make the beam have an angular acceleration going this way. And when you have exactly equal weights in both baskets, uh, the beam doesn't accelerate at all in the angular directions. Right? Uh, and of course, the whole balance scale isn't accelerating up or down. And so you know that you know, counteracting these uh, weights of both the scale itself and the objects in the scale, there must be support forces that are acting up, uh, whose total magnitude is equal and opposite to the total um, weight of the scale plus objects in the scale. Okay? And so this would give you one way to measure uh, the weight of an object. You put your object somewhere, you have a carefully calibrated collection of objects whose weight you already know, and you kind of stack them against each other until this uh, seesaw balances, basically. Okay? Um, you'll notice that most, most scales uh, use some different principle. You know, when you're standing on a bathroom scale or something, you're not standing in one basket of a balance beam. Um, and so most scales are based on the idea of stretching or compressing springs, right? And so what, what does this kind of setup look like? Um, so again, I'm going to have some kind of like hanging basket, for instance. I'm imagining one of those scales uh, at a grocery store. Um, and this basket will be basically be connected to like a series of interlocking gears. So there's some gears over here. There's like a wheel with gears over here. And this whole thing, let me give myself a little bit more space. Uh, and this whole thing will then be connected to a spring, which in this class I'll draw either, you know, as like a rotating spiral or a common physicist's uh, shorthand for a spring is to just draw lines going back and forth like this. Because as you've probably noticed, um, a lot of physicists are not very good at drawing. So, uh, and then you've got, so you've got this uh, basket connected directly to like some teeth of a gear. You've got um, some other gear that makes contact with uh, those teeth. Um, this whole thing is connected to a spring and then the whole thing is kind of hanging from the ceiling or something. So how does this uh, contraption work? You know, as you load up the basket with a bunch of fruit, uh, with a bunch of fruit, um, well, there's a force uh, due to gravity, right? All of these fruit have some total weight, so there's a force due to gravity pulling uh, pulling this down, uh, and that will stretch out this spring a little bit, right? Uh, and the spring will stretch until a point where the basket, you know, no longer moves downward. Right? When you first put an item on a spring scale, the whole scale starts to accelerate downward. And it does so until the spring has stretched enough um, so that it's balancing out the weight of the objects that it's uh, supporting. So you've got a force of gravity pointing down. You've got kind of a force from the spring, from the spring being stretched, uh, pointing up. And, you know, this whole thing would then be connected to some kind of uh, dial, right? So sticking off of this central circular gear, there's like some, some, you know, hand, there's a dial, and it says, oh, this is zero pounds, one pound two pounds, whatever, three kilograms, five kilograms, you know, whatever it is, okay. Uh, so again, you place an object in this hanging basket that exerts a force downward on the basket as the weight of the object gets communicated to the basket itself. Uh, that basket accelerates downward, stretching the spring that it's connected to, and the spring stretches until the force that the spring supplies um, balances out the weight of the object, right? And then presumably these scales and this spring is calibrated in such a way so that the amount that the spring stretches in like this vertical direction gets converted by these gears to some, you know, the dial spins some amount around, uh, around the dial face. Okay, uh, great, <laughs> great. So uh, this is a much more common way to measure forces, measure weights that is. Um, and let's talk a little bit more quantitatively about what 
the spring is doing. And to do that, we need to start developing a language to describe uh, springs. Okay, so uh, springs. Uh, okay, so springs uh, are going to be you know objects that can be compressed or stretched. Um, you know, as I'm sure you've seen, uh, you've seen what a spring looks like. I'm sure. Um, and the basic idea is that both stretching and compressing a spring, stretching and compressing a spring, um, causes the spring to exert a restoring force. So it causes the spring to exert a restoring force. Okay. And uh, additionally, every spring, um, if you leave it on its own and has and you know don't have any forces acting on it, um, we'll say that the spring has some kind of natural length that the material the spring is made out of and the way the spring was made, it has some natural length that the spring wants to be. So uh, we'll say a spring um, that is relaxed and is experiencing no forces has no uh, net forces on it. So a spring that is relaxed uh, and has no net forces uh, acting on its ends, acting on it, um, will be at its rest length, at its uh, rest length. So I'm going to use some of these terms interchangeably, things like rest length um, or equilibrium length. Sometimes I'll probably even say equilibrium rest length. They mean the same thing. Uh, you know, it's the length that the spring naturally wants to be at um, if there's no forces acting on it, uh, no net forces acting on it. Okay. Uh, why is the force that the spring exerts called a restoring force? It's called a restoring force um, because the direction that the force acts is always in such a way to try to restore the spring to this equilibrium rest length. If you try to stretch a spring, the forces point back to try to compress the spring. If you compress the spring, the forces that the spring exerts point outward. Again, pointing in the direction of trying to restore the spring to its equilibrium rest length. Okay. Um, one quick comment about you know, how we use a spring scale um, before, uh, before we start describing quantitatively how springs work um, is to point out that even with a spring scale, uh, you're not directly measuring the weight of an object. Um, what you're really measuring is how much force the scale is exerting on the object. Right? Uh, one way of thinking about this is to say, you know, suppose you had these apples, um, but they weren't just sitting there, you were actually pushing down on them. You know, the scale doesn't know the difference between the weight of the apples and you applying a force. It just reports the total force that it needs to exert in order to um, have the basket not be accelerating, right? So if the object um, is not accelerating and the scale is on level ground um, and there's no other forces acting on the objects, then once the scale comes to rest, uh, the scale reports the measure of the weight of these objects. But if the scale doesn't, if the objects don't fulfill all those requirements, you know, the scale doesn't know what's going on. It's just reporting the force that it's exerting in order to, you know, have the spring not stretch anymore. Okay. Uh, it also means that if the objects are themselves accelerating, uh, you should also not trust your scale, at least not until the scale stops bouncing around. Right? If I took an apple and I threw it down at the scale, you know, the moment that it's first contacting the scale, um, there's both an acceleration of the apple and also the weight of the apple. And so the total force that these apples are exerting down on the scale is bigger than the force of just, you know, how much is gravity pulling down on these apples. So again, the things that these scales are measuring are really just measures of the force the spring itself is supplying in order to fulfill some criteria. Okay, okay. similarly, of course, uh, springs don't measure masses, they measure weights. So if you took your spring scale to the moon, just like we saw in the first homework set, um, the weight of objects on the moon are different, and so the force that a spring scale needs to supply to balance that weight is also different. Okay. Uh, with those little uh, caveats aside, let's actually talk a little bit more quantitatively about what it's like to stretch and compress a spring. 
So stretching and compressing springs. 4.1.2. Right, we've got the principle behind spring scales. You know, um, springs stretch and they, if there's like a weight attached to them or forces acting on them, or they compress if there's forces acting on them, and they exert forces to try to uh, restore the spring to its equilibrium length. Um, but, you know, we want to think about the world not just in these qualitative terms, but to think about the world with numbers attached, right? So, uh, you know, springs are everywhere. It's easy to find. It's easy to find them. So, you know, let's play around and uh, get a feel for what what the forces a spring uh, exerts are. So here, I just took apart, you know, one of my pens, and inside all of pen all pens that have one of those little clicker things, um, you know, there's a small spring like this. I don't know how visible that is, but I'm sure you've seen a pen spring before, you know. And if I just don't exert any net forces on this spring, um, it has some natural length it wants to be. It's about this much. Uh, that's its equilibrium rest length, right? If the spring was wound more tightly or if there was more turns, the equilibrium rest length would be different, okay? And this spring exerts a restoring force. You know, if I try to pull it, the spring, uh, you know, if I pull this way, so if I pull this way, the spring pulls back this way. And similarly, if I try to uh, compress it, so if I apply force this way, uh, the spring pushes back that way, right? What about quantitatively? That's just the direction that the force acts, but we know that force, it's a vector, so it has a direction and a magnitude. Um, you know, play, play around with your own pen uh, spring as we explore this. Uh, you know, at first it feels really easy to deform the spring. I barely have to push it all to get it to, you know, compress a little bit. But the more I compress, uh, the harder I have to push. And similarly, I can stretch it, you know, at first really easily without applying barely any force. But then, you know, the more I want to stretch the spring, the more uh, force it seems to apply to restore the spring to its natural state. And also, you know, if I try to, like, hold this end fixed and pull this end a certain distance, uh, and I compare the force that I need to pull in order to do that versus if I hold, you know, if I'm just trying to stretch half the spring, it feels like I have to pull harder to stretch only like a small portion of the spring. So those are kind of a set of observations about um, how the restoring force of these springs seem to behave. Um, what, what does that look like in a uh, quantitative sense? We've already said that if uh, there's no force acting on the spring, it's just sitting at its uh, equilibrium rest length. And we might also say that uh, when something is experiencing no net forces, uh, and there's no forces being exerted on it, that it's in a state of mechanical equilibrium. This is where equilibrium comes up a lot, and we'll see it a lot more throughout the rest of the class. So I leave the spring alone. It has some natural uh, natural length. And what I want to talk about is I want to have like a language that lets me talk about the distortion of a spring, uh, distortion of a spring away from its rest length or its equilibrium length. Um, and this is going to be a vector quantity, right? So, for instance, uh, first of all, why can't uh, why can't I spell and talk at the same time? Um, you know, let's imagine defining the let's let's say we've got a spring that's like this, um, and let's imagine that the left edge here is like fixed in space, like maybe it's attached to a wall or a ceiling or something like that. Um, but there's no forces acting on this spring, so it's at its equilibrium uh, equilibrium length. Right? I might describe the distortion of this spring by specifying like where is the other end of the spring located. Right? And this is a position. So I kind of want to describe distortions of springs as a vector quantity. So distortions, in this case, um, are a vector quantity. Uh, so for instance, you know, if this is the equilibrium rest length, and so maybe I'll call this position, you know, uh, x equals zero. Um, if I stretch the spring out so that the other end is over here, maybe I'll call this dis this uh, position. Uh, well, it's at some other position. You know, maybe this is x equals one centimeter or something. And so, you know, I'll use the position of one end relative to the other uh, to kind of quantify how distorted my spring is, right? So that's like when I had this uh, this ballpoint pen spring. I guess it's a roller ball pen spring. 
you know, if I hold this end fixed, I can describe the distortion by saying, you know, uh, if I pull it this way, you know, there's both a direction and a magnitude that describes how the spring has changed. And if I compress it, there's also both a direction and a magnitude describing it. You know, so here the distortion might be x equals, you know, uh, one, let's say, centimeter. And over here, it might be, if it's a compressed spring, uh, this position might be like x equals minus one, for instance. Okay, so um, uh, that's great. So we have the distortion of a spring uh, written as a vector quantity. And we kind of noticed when I was playing around with this little spring that the restoring force felt like it got bigger the more distorted the spring was. The greater the magnitude of the distortion, um, the greater the restoring force. We also observed uh, I never know how to, there we go. Uh, we also observed that the you know, restoring force pointed in the opposite direction of the distortion. When I stretched the spring out so that the distortion you know, was a vector going from 0 to positive 1, when I stretched the spring out, uh, distortion, uh, the spring was pulling back in this direction. And when I compressed the spring so that the distortion was going this way, the force was in the other direction. Right? So we have this sense then, just by playing around, that the restoring force of a spring has to depend both on how much we distort the spring and it points in the opposite direction. It turns out the actual relationship between those quantities is as simple as it could have been. So it turns out the restoring force of a spring um, is just equal to, uh, well, it points in the opposite direction of the distortion, and there's some quantity, which we'll call the spring constant, k, um, that just characterizes how stiff that spring is. You know, if I have a spring that's made um, out of thicker pieces of metal, uh, the spring will be harder to move around, it'll be harder to stretch and compress compared to this particular spring. And if I make the spring out of a different material altogether, it might have a different kind of level that I can compress or stretch it at. So, um, so the restoring force that a spring supplies is equal to the negative of some spring constant multiplied by a distortion, which I've already written up there, so that's very convenient. Okay. So for instance, if I draw a bunch of springs, you know, suppose I have, um, like I have a wall over here, and I attach a bunch of springs, and I want these all to basically be, you know, identical springs. And let's say this is the equilibrium rest length of the springs I'm going to consider. So, uh, so like, this level is what I'll call like distortion equals zero. If the spring is attached to this wall and the other end is on this line, uh, as you'll see in just a second, I'll say that that spring is at its rest length, right? So, you know, I take the same spring, I attach it to the wall. I do this little wiggle symbol. Here, uh, the distortion is zero, and the spring doesn't exert any restoring forces. So the distortion is zero, the spring's at its equilibrium rest length, so the restoring force that the spring is exerting uh, is also zero. Now, what happens if I take that spring and stretch it? Let's say this is x equal like one centimeter. Well, the force will be uh, minus the vector distortion times some spring constant, right? So, you know, let's say we choose, we have a spring whose spring constant is such so that the magnitude of this force is one newton, um, and the direction that it points is this way. Again, the force is pointing in such a way to try to restore the spring to its equilibrium rest length, okay? Now, this equation that we wrote down tells us, you know, the, again, the magnitude of the force is exactly equal to the magnitude of the distortion multiplied by some number. So that tells me that, you know, if I take, again, the same spring and I stretch it twice as far, twice as far, so that the distortion now is two centimeters, I know that one, the force is pointing in the direction opposite the distortion, and I know that the magnitude of this restoring force is two newtons, because this equation tells me that, you know, if I know k, so that I can write, you know, 
the magnitude of a force fighting against the one centimeter distortion is one newton, then the spring distorted by two centimeters will have a two newton restoring force. Similarly, if I compress this same spring, say to here, so that now the distortion is, you know, minus one centimeter, it's one centimeter, but it's pointing that way, I know two things. I know the restoring force is going to be the same magnitude as when the spring was distorted one centimeter in the other direction. So again, the magnitude of this restoring force is just one newton. Um, but I know that it points in the opposite direction. So the distortion in this case, you know, is pointing this way and the restoring force is pointing in the opposite direction, which is what this minus sign is telling us. Right? Okay, great. So this relationship uh, is known as Hooke's law. Hooke's law, right? And it's exactly what we wrote above. It says that um, if you distort a spring, the restoring force um, that that spring will exert is going to be equal to negative some spring constant, characterizing you know the type of spring and stuff like that, multiplied by the distortion of the spring. So again, compress the spring, it pushes out. Uh, stretch the spring and it kind of pulls in. Okay, and this uh, this this law was named after uh, Robert Hooke, who discovered it in the 1670s, I guess. You might be wondering at this point, like, why are we spending so much time talking about springs? You know, uh, sure, there's springs, you know, in a lot of places in the world around us. There's springs uh, in our pens. There's springs in like measuring scales and stuff like that. Um, are they really that important? It actually turns out that they are that important. And they're important not because Hooke's law is a statement about how springs work. Um, it's a statement that actually many objects will respond to a distortion away from some like equilibrium shape by exerting restoring forces that are proportional to that distortion. So if you sit in like a comfy armchair, the cushions uh, to a certain point will push upward with a force proportional to how far you're squishing that chair cushion down. You know, if you stretch a rubber band, uh, you need to pull again, kind of proportionally to the amount that you're trying to stretch it. You know, if you're uh, kicking a soccer ball, um, the amount that you you know cause the surface of that soccer ball uh, to bend, well, the ball will push back with a restoring force proportional to that kind of amount of distortion. Okay, so Hooke's law was discovered in the context of simple springs, but it turns out to be incredibly general. Now, of course, there's a limit to this behavior. Uh, you know, there's a limit. There's a limit. Uh, you know, first, eventually everything breaks. You know, you stretch anything too far, uh, the rubber band will snap, uh, you'll explode the soccer ball, you know, you'll permanently deform your couch cushions, uh, this kind of thing. Uh, so one, you know, eventually things break. Eventually things break. There's also another way in which there's a limit to this, and that's you know, this simple linear relationship between force and distortion, this idea that the magnitude of the force is exactly proportional to the magnitude of the displacement, that only holds over some range of deformations. Uh, so it turns out that, you know, every object, every object has some, uh, we'll call it like an elastic limit, elastic limit. So if you keep your distortions like smaller than this elastic limit, you'll discover that Hooke's law holds for all sorts of things. If you deform it too far, you'll see that this proportionality between force and distortion eventually breaks down. And it's more complicated than just this simple um, linear relationship. Okay. Um, so Hooke's law uh, covers the forces uh, that a spring exerts as it's deformed. Um, but you know, when I'm taking this spring and I'm deforming it, what am I doing? Like I'm applying a force over some distance, you know, so to compress this spring, I, you know, apply a force this way, and I apply that force over some distance. And what do we call applying a force uh, over some distance? Um, that's a work, right? So remember, <laughs> remember, you know, work, mechanical work, uh, due to translating an object, uh, is given by the force dotted into the displacement. You know? So here I'm taking this end of the spring and I'm displacing it some amount and I'm applying some force in order to do so. Um, 
So that means, you know, there's work involved. There's some energy. And since energy is conserved, you know, that work has to have gone into something, right? And you won't be surprised to know since, you know, if I, uh, you know, apply this force and then I let it go, the spring, you know, bounces back. And if I wasn't holding it, it would like jump out, uh, jump, you know, up out of my hand. Uh, the spring is able to store the energy of the work that I put into it. Um, so springs can store elastic energy. So springs can store... Oh, that's a bad set of arrows. <laughs> springs can store elastic energy. So this is another type of energy. We kind of hinted at it in chapter one, I think. Um, remember, energy as a whole has to be conserved, um, but it can flow back and forth between both different objects and different forms of energy. So we've already you know, spent a lot of time thinking about kinetic energy, both translational and rotational kinetic energy. We've thought about gravitational potential energy. We've thought about like thermal, like heat energy, food energy. Springs store elastic energy, um, which we could also call elastic potential energy. Elastic potential energy. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, a spring that has work done to it stores some elastic potential energy. Uh, when you let go, that elastic energy can be released and transformed back into, say, kinetic energy or, you know, whatever. Potential energy any number of things, depending on the situation. So, you know, earlier, uh, for gravitational potential energy, GPE, um, we said that that was equal to the mass of an object times the acceleration due to gravity times the height of some object. And let me start using the symbol U to refer to different types of potential energies. So U with a G subscript might stand for gravitational potential energy, and we've seen this equation uh, before. Um, for elastic potential energy, for elastic potential energy, the expression turns out to be uh, the elastic energy stored in a spring is given by uh, one half times the same spring constant that you know we wrote down that describes the restoring force times the square of the distortion of that spring. Okay, um, this will start to bring us actually to the second reason that springs are secretly so important, um, which kind of has to do with their idealized behavior. Okay, so let's imagine um, the following thing. You know, earlier, uh, thinking about kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy, I gave the example of, you know, someone throwing a ball upward with some velocity, right? And if I call the height that the ball starts out at, um, like h equals zero, you know, what this ball uh, does is, you know, at first it's got no gravitational potential energy, but it's got kinetic energy. As it goes up, you know, the ball slows down because gravity is pointing downward. There's an acceleration due to gravity pointing downward. So that opposes the direction of velocity initially. So it starts out with some velocity and it slows down as it rises. The whole time it's rising, it's gaining gravitational potential energy. It reaches the top, you know, at the top, it pauses for a brief second. It has no velocity whatsoever. And then it starts falling back down, right? Picking up kinetic energy as its velocity increases while losing gravitational potential energy. So if I were to draw that whole process kind of in the following way, let me imagine having time going this way. Um, let me first use red to stand for, say, the kinetic energy. Um, you know, at first it starts at some value. You know, this is one half mv squared from the kinetic energy formula. Um, as the ball starts going up, you know, its velocity slows down, so its kinetic energy is decreasing. At the maximum height, it like pauses for a second. It has no velocity, which means it has no kinetic energy. And then the ball starts falling back down. Kinetic energy picks back up. And then, you know, when it gets back to h equals zero, um, it should be at the same velocity. Now, at the same time, what's the gravitational potential energy doing? Well, we say it's starting out at h equals zero. So it's starting out at zero. Um, it's reaching some maximum at a maximum height, which is when the ball's velocity is zero, and, you know, it kind of does something like this in between. And importantly, by the conservation of energy, we know that these two things always have to sum up to the same value. You know, as long as we're neglecting air resistance, energy is conserved. I mean, energy is conserved anyway, but as long as we're neglecting air resistance, the only forms of energy we can have are either the kinetic energy 
or the gravitational potential energy in this simple example. So whatever the ball loses in kinetic energy, it has to gain in gravitational potential energy. So that means the sum of this red curve plus the blue curve is some constant value across the whole trajectory of this, uh, this experiment of throwing a ball up and watching it come down. It's one of the ways in which we can invoke the conservation of energy to understand, you know, how fast is this ball going at different heights? What's the relationship between the maximum height it gets to and the initial velocity? All of this stuff. Okay, well now let's consider a spring instead of someone throwing, um, someone throwing a ball up in the air. Okay, so suppose I have a spring, um, and just for convenience, I'm going to say it's got, you know, like some handle that it's attached to. So, you know, there you go. Uh, and this is the equilibrium rest length of the spring. Okay, so this uh, is the rest length. So I'll call, you know, this point x equals zero. When this end of the spring is over here, it's not distorted at all, assuming that the left end is kind of fixed over here. Uh, okay, so let's suppose someone comes along and uh, and stretches this spring, like so, and they're holding it. You know, at first they're holding it in place. Right, so they're exerting some force. Uh, they're exerting a, a force like this that's balanced as the spring is held still um, by whatever the, you know, this restoring force is. These would be equal and opposite if we're saying, you know, it's in a state where it's not accelerating at the moment. Uh, so what do we know? We know the spring is being stretched. It's, uh, you know, it's applying a restoring force. And we know that that spring has some energy associated with it, right? Uh, and we saw up above that the energy associated with that kind of elastic stretching is uh, one half times whatever the spring constant is times, you know, this distortion squared, you know, so whatever this distance is. So now what I want to imagine is what happens when this person lets go, right? So when this person lets go, I have the spring stretched out uh, by the same amount. Um, but now there's an unbalanced force, right? The spring is still away from its equilibrium rest length, but now there's nothing kind of holding it in that stretched position. So the spring starts accelerating. It starts kind of compressing, right? So uh, at this point, it still has, you know, before it starts moving, let's say, the instant that someone lets go, it still has this, you know, elastic potential energy, one half kx squared, um, and at first it's not moving. The kinetic energy is zero. Okay, um, a little bit later, it's gonna get to its equilibrium rest length, right? So let's say this is, you know, distortion equals zero. What happens here? At the equilibrium rest length, uh, the spring is storing no elastic potential energy. But it's moving, right? Like it's picked up some velocity um, as you know this unbalanced force causes it to accelerate moving from here to here. How much kinetic energy does it have at x equals zero? Well, we know that it has to have, by conservation of energy, you know, the kinetic energy when the elastic potential energy is zero is equal to however much elastic potential energy it started with. Because in this simple example, those are the two forms of energy we're trading back and forth. So, you know, let me call this quantity like E initial. So at this point, the kinetic energy that this spring has is E initial. You know, it doesn't have any elastic potential energy or spring potential energy anymore. That's all been converted into kinetic energy. The fact that it's moving means, you know, it's not just going to instantaneously stop here. Actually, the spring is going to keep compressing until at some point it slows down and comes to a stop. So it's come to a stop. So what do we know about the kinetic energy? The kinetic energy must be zero since it's not moving. But now it's compressed, right? So what is the amount of elastic energy that it must be storing by being compressed? Well, again, by conservation of energy, at this kind of maximum point of compression, it must be storing as much elastic potential energy as we started this thing out with. So that's E initial again. So if I look at the behavior of the position of this spring as a function of time. So let me write this as like, um, let me write this as the distortion in the x direction. Distortion in the x direction. What does this look like? You know, it starts out at some value. Um, it starts accelerating. It 
comes to its equilibrium rest length, but it's got zero velocity, so it keeps going. It gets to a point equally far away because we need the 1 half kx squared over here to be the same as 1 half kx squared over here. That means the distortion at this point must be exactly as negative as the distortion at this point is positive. And then the cycle keeps repeating, right? Uh, the elastic energy gets converted back into kinetic energy, back into elastic energy, back into kinetic energy, so on and so forth. And I've drawn this uh, very poorly, but what it should look like is, you know, a wave just kind of going back and forth perfectly evenly, right? Um, this is called uh, simple harmonic motion, right? This idea that you um, have the position of an object just kind of, you know, simply oscillating as it sloshes energy from one form to another um, in this even steady way. Uh, it's called simple harmonic motion. And this spring, this spring system would be called a simple harmonic oscillator. It turns out harmonic oscillators are just everywhere in the world around us. I mean, they show up in spring systems, but they also show up in like pendulums, the strings of your guitar, the vibrations in the air that you hear, the way your eardrum works, the way electricity is flowing through the wires in your home, um, the way the shock absorbers in your car work, like they show up everywhere, uh, even in the way like uh, atoms quantum mechanically behave, right? So we'll see a lot more about harmonic motion and harmonic oscillators in the future chapters. Um, but the fact that springs are kind of the simplest version of this kind of harmonic motion, this oscillating behavior, means that they're a crucial building block for a surprisingly wide variety of, of real physical systems. Right. Uh, of course, you might wonder, you know, when you step on a spring scale, why doesn't the reading on the scale just oscillate forever in the way we just described? Um, it's because of friction, right? Uh, there are internal mechanisms in all of these scales. For instance, in the terrible drawing I made all the way at the top, you've got some amount of friction as the gears and the teeth move past each other. Um, and as the scale oscillates a little bit, uh, it's always losing, in the real world, some amount of energy to friction, right? So in the real world, rather than having this perfect, you know, you end up with exactly equal amounts of um, potential energy stored after every cycle, in the real world, you lose a little bit of energy to friction at every cycle. So you trade potential and kinetic energy back and forth, um, but sliding friction is kind of always turning some of that into uh, thermal energy, siphoning some of it away, until eventually, um, you know, you've stepped on a scale, the scale eventually stops oscillating, you stop accelerating, you come to rest, and once you've come to rest, uh, that means you have no net forces, and that means the scale is now accurately, you know, assessing uh, your weight, um, which was the goal of this section in the first place.